Tunisia grinds to a halt. <laughs> the country's largest trade union calls a general strike after President Kai's side freezes wages and cuts subsidies. But can sides survive without union support? And who could possibly fill a political void? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Tunisia. Right now, the biggest challenge to Kai Saeed's rule is not coming from his opponents in government. It's coming from the country's largest trade union. On Thursday, the UGTT organized a mass public sector walkout in response to the president's planned economic reforms. Flights were canceled, buses and trains were halted, and government offices were closed. Saeed is in the midst of trying to raise funds to prevent the country's economic collapse. And in an attempt to secure a $4 billion loan from the IMF, he froze public sector wages and cut subsidies, causing unions to revolt. What brought us to this situation is this government. If we have come to this point, it is because this is a stubborn government which sows discord and spreads false information. The program that was presented to the IMF for economic reforms is what should be presented to the people and not the nice titles. Tell the truth to the people. Well, the union walkout coincides with another strike in the country. Tunisia's judges walked out in protest after the president fired 57 members of the judiciary, accusing them of corruption. I have given numerous opportunities and warnings for the judiciary to get its act together. I cannot eradicate corruption and law-breaking in the country without completely purging the judicial system. We see deliberate delays in opening all the cases, although they are ready. Besides critics who are increasing in numbers say it's all a ploy to silence his opponents and consolidate power. When Kai side won 2019's election in a landslide, he came to power with very little experience. In the space of a few years, he outmaneuvered many of his political opponents. He sacked the prime minister, suspended parliament, and assumed almost complete control. He says he was protecting the country from chaos, but his critics called his actions a coup. Still, the former law professor isn't done. Next month, Tunisia is set to hold a referendum on a new constitution. And many fear it's yet another attempt for Saeed to tighten his grip. When some came out to protest the upcoming vote, they were met with force. We came as political parties and activists to express our views, but we were attacked by the police who sprayed gas in our faces and attacked us. So while President Said has said he's doing the hard work needed to overhaul the system and set Tunisia on a path to prosperity, others argue he is destroying the democratic gains of the 2011 revolution. So which is it? Joining me now to debate that and more from Tunis is Gaia Ben Mbarak, a journalist covering the strike as well as social justice issues in Tunisia. From Doha, Yusuf Wandel, a professor of political science at Qatar University. And from Brussels, Yasmin Akrimi, a North Africa research analyst at the Brussels International Center. Thanks all so much for being with us. Gaia, I will start with you because you are in the country covering what's been happening. Tell us what you're witnessing this time, and is it changing the actual dynamics in Tunisia? I mean, certainly things have been moving quite quickly in the past few days uh, in Tunisia. Yesterday, we witnessed the first uh, general strike in the public sector uh, called for by the uh, biggest uh, trade union uh, organization in Tunisia, which is uh, UGTT, the uh, General Tunisian Union of Workers. Um, what we saw yesterday is definitely um, considered big uh, in uh, terms of the uh, uh, of the uh, 
the, the, the major uh, institutions that were uh, targeted and that were affected uh, by the strike. We've seen 159 institutions uh, strike. Uh, it is estimated that 3 million workers uh, participated in yesterday's uh, strike, but definitely the impact of that strike uh, um, definitely was seen in more than just public sector workers. As um, UGTT estimates says that 100% of uh, transportation um, uh, has participated in yesterday's strike, thus affecting definitely even people working in private sector or in uh, other uh, spans. Now, okay. uh, mm -hmm. Now, I, I, but I have to ask also, I mean, just how serious is the fact that the unions have essentially turned on Kai Sai? Because, you know, not long ago, some complained that the unions were not responding to signs of dictatorial behavior and that they were giving Kai Sai too much of the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I mean, UGTT... We cannot like actually say that it turned against Kaisai because their position from the beginning has been very cautious. Yes, talking about giving uh, the president the benefit of the doubt, but they never were conclusive in terms of their uh, position regarding uh, what happened uh, on July 25th and afterwards. However, AGTD definitely has been very um, firm in its uh, uh, approach to the national dialogue called for by President Kaisai, calling it uh, not inclusive and not the format that they were uh, hoping for. Yesterday, strike was called apolitical by UGTT uh, leadership. However, people on the ground have told me that it is definitely very political. Yes, the the uh, arguments used and uh, the uh, the uh, demands of that strike was purely socio-economic. However, we cannot see that outside of the polit current political framework um, that we found uh, ourselves uh, ourselves in, especially with an eminent referendum that many people have called very very uh, undemocratic and uh, uh, something that would not actually bring about the change that people uh, were hoping uh, for uh, since uh, last uh, summer. Okay. Uh, Yasmin, let me ask you what you make of the union's position now. I mean, Gaia was describing it as somewhat ambiguous before. They're still saying um, that they're apolitical in many of their actions, but this is nevertheless very decisive action that does not in any way make Kai's side look good, even if it is said to be apolitical by the unions? Yes, when when you said the the UGTT gave Kai Sai too much the, of the, the benefit of the doubt, the whole country gave him, and a large portion of the country is still giving him too much of the benefit of the doubt and allowing uh, a lot of signs of serious authoritarianism to just be interpreted in, in other ways. Now, the UGTT has been uh, uh, calling for a dialogue way before the 25th of July. So they have been calling for a dialogue and for some sort of consensus since the beginning, and they have maintained consistently that position when Kai Saeed uh, did what he did last year. Um, and the, the, the president just did not, uh, um, you know, show any sign of openness or of wanting to um, discuss anything with the UGTT and with any other uh, stakeholder or, dare I say, a uh, possible um, counterpower because this is the, this is the topic uh, of, of of like the, the the real stake. The president is really trying to put aside or to minimize the role of any possible counterpower, and the UGTT is if not the most significant counterpower in the country way before the 25th of July. This is not new. Um, so it, the the president has a real. Um, let's say, interest in trying to minimize or um, weaken the role of the UGTT. So this is very mm. serious and mm. very much a political strike yesterday, yes. It's interesting, though, as you say, a lot of the country is still giving Kai side uh, the benefit of the doubt, which you don't necessarily think is a good thing. Um, some others say that Tunisians, for because of the bad options that are available, they just have to manage expectations. And Kai Said is kind of the only one that might have a more hopeful outlook for still a number of Tunisians. I mean, is, is that kind of how sad it's gotten for some? 
Definitely, definitely. There is a real lack of viable options, uh, and I hear it all the time. So if if we we you know put that one aside, meaning Qaisaid, who do we uh, who's there to rule us? What are our political options um, now? If let me tell you this: if if any other political leader did and continued to do and to speak. Uh, the way Qais Saeed is doing and is speaking, there would be an outcry across the country. Now, the real uh, asset of Qais Saeed is his uh, alleged, I want to say, honesty and uh, his you know, fight against corruption and the whole narrative of I am the people and I am your only um, honest option. So this is really his, his um, main political um, capital, if, if, uh, if I dare to say. But we're seeing it, like clear signs of dictatorship, clear signs of a presidentialist uh, regime are, are, you know, are, are here. And this constitution, this referendum, and we're, we're maybe going to talk about it after, but this referendum is very, very unclear. The whole process is very opaque and undemocratic. Right. And like right. Saya said, uh, uh, there, there is very little, um, you know, participation of, of, you know, civil society, political parties, every s significant stakeholder in the country. Exactly. L exactly. Let me ask Yusuf about that, because Yusuf, as we know, there's... Kaiside is still planning this referendum next month uh, to approve the the constitutional changes that he will have made. I mean, how is that going to play out? Who's actually rewriting the constitution now? I think it's uh, very difficult to say whether the constitutional referendum will go ahead mm -hmm. or not at this stage. Obviously, this is the uh, most difficult test that Kay Said has. Uh, experience since coming uh, to power. Obviously, he has taken uh, several uh, steps regarding suspending the uh, parliament and asking to rely to the constitution. He had uh, a go with the judges when once he suspended the uh, constitutional council. He filed a lot of uh, judges at the beginning of the month and so on and so forth. But this is the most important test in his leadership with the, the most powerful trade union in uh, Tunisia, basically at loggerhead with Kai Said. The uh, strike, uh, like your guest said, from uh, Tunisia is uh, uh, social and economic, but there is a very important political dimension in it. Kai Said uh, is new in politics. He claims to be uh, uh, fighting corruption and he wants uh, to model uh, Tunisia to his, uh, to his own uh, image, but the, the, the strikes today and uh, obviously the uh, strikes against the new uh, the, this new referendum uh, last week suggest that basically his grip on power and his plans for the future at uh, as uh, at, at stake. Uh, okay. Depending on what's going to happen in the next uh, few days will affect, in my opinion, a big deal what will Kaisai do and the results of the referendum, as well as, let's not forget, the uh, parliamentary elections in December this year. Okay. So, Gaia, I mean, depending on what will happen in the next few days, um, in the meantime and in the immediate term, there's a fear about how much damage these strikes can actually inflict on an economy that really can't afford much further strain. So what do you foresee in the immediate term? Yeah, yesterday the reaction uh, on the street, even like as I was going downtown uh, with talking to people in my neighborhood, people, yes, kept criticizing UGTT and saying that this is not the time. The country is already drowning in debt. Uh, the um, negotiations with the IMF are still on hold. And uh, they are very much like... Uh, kind of believing the rhetoric that President Qais Saeed and his allies and his supporters are um, uh, depicting to the uh, to the public outside. However, um, yesterday also the government like spoke about like 1 billion Tunisian dinars of losses. However, these losses already exist and this is not new. Like every time EGTT goes on the strike, every time um, the working class starts like um, taking on demands out to, to the street, we see these rhetorics um, kind of portrayed by uh, 
the government. So it's not only the side government that have said this. This is like this is kind of a, a, a folkloric, um, a folkloric uh, kind of kind of speech that keeps uh, taking place. The country is already in debt. The country is already struggling, and the demands that UGT has raised is also um, are also like the demand of the working class, and are also the demand of people uh, out uh, on the street. Um, but it seems that the um, government, instead of opening negotiations and opening dialogue with UGT, which is like the biggest. Uh, social partner that any government could have and uh, whether you like it or not it is the, the representative uh, of the people that kind of took on um, the demonization uh, st communication uh, strategy and that was actually said by UGTT Secretary General uh, Tabdoubi yesterday addressing the crowd in front of UGTT headquarters uh, downtown in Tunis and also said by uh, people uh, uh, like who belong to uh, different uh, unions uh, across the country. The demands of that strike were socioeconomic, were also um, uh, an alarm uh, to tell the government not to um, uh, uh, go on with the terms with the IMF because currently uh, the uh, reform program that was proposed by the government, the government said that they included UGT, but UGT denied that. And this right. uh, reform program includes more cuts on subsidies, which was actually um, yesterday uh, people protested against that and said it is through subsidies that Tunisians are able to live and we cannot accept the governments to go on and actually accept IMF's uh, term if they are to acquire uh, a loan. Okay, so Yasmin, I'd like you to speak to that as well. I mean, where does all of this leave talks with the IMF on a bailout plan? I mean, how much leverage does the union actually have uh, in any agreement with the IMF, and how much is the government actually at the mercy of that? Yeah, well, I, I was hearing uh, the, um, the the speech of not uh, not the leader of of uh, the UGTT, so not Tabubi, uh, uh, but another another leader who said that when uh, uh, the government went to negotiate with the UGTT. Um, they had the IMF demands in the back of their of their heads, and then um, consequently, there weren't really negotiations. These were um, just, you know, like something for for show, just to say we negotiated with the UGTT. Now, the le yesterday's strike was very costly for the country, but I, I want to ask, uh, uh, how much is the referendum going to cost? Mm. How much mm. is a, a, a one year and a half process? where the country, uh, you know, like, for example, the IMF cannot give money to a country with an ongoing uh, uh, electoral process. This is not happening. How much is that costing us? Why, why, why aren't, uh, you know, people criticizing that and just criticizing, you know, the UGTT strikes, which was coming? I mean, uh, uh, there is no continuity in, in, in state promises because of the political instability that started in 2011. So every agreement that the UGTT reaches with one government, that government is gone after six months or one year, and they have to redo everything. So this was expectable from the UGTT. They're doing their, their job. It's their position. But regarding the, the IMF, I mean, the most problematic uh, part of negotiating with the IMF that we have a president that has a very um, nationalist, uh, uh, non-interventionist discourse saying, no, we're not going to go through with the IMF demands. And then you have a government which sole um, uh, you know, task is to negotiate with the IMF, excluding the union, when the IMF said, if you do not reach an agreement with the union, meaning the government does not reach an agreement with the union, there will be no money for Tunisia. So this is the most problematic part. The second, and I'm just going to end with this, is the government and the state in general, so the government and the president need to tell Tunisian people how bad the, the, the economic situation is. They need to tell us that this is bad, and then we're going to through with the IMF. Uh, we're going to go through with the IMF's demands because we have no other choice. Instead, uh, they're hiding it, which which basically uh, you know fuels the idea of 
um, the, we can we can set aside the IMF's uh, demands and then go through with another uh, uh, you know other reforms. We cannot do okay. that. It's simply untrue. Okay, let, let, uh, Yusuf, I want to get your take on that. Um, do you think the government has not communicated clearly with Tunisians about the real state of their economy and what might need to be sacrificed, what negotiations and compromises uh, might have to be made? Is, is there that issue, as Yasmin was, was describing there? I think it's there, but uh, even the layman would know that there are several problems uh -huh with the economic situation in uh, Tunisia. Numbers speak for themselves. We have unemployment, which is about 18%, inflation, which is almost 8% in Tunisia. And this problem has been exasperated by a COVID over the last couple of years, and more recently with the war in the Ukraine. These, in my opinion, have made the situation worse for uh, Tunisians. The uh, Tunisian government is in a catch-22 situation. On the one hand, it needs this $4 billion bailout from the IMF. As we all know, the IMF money doesn't come, uh, does come with a lot of uh, strings uh, attached uh, to it. And this, uh, if, and this will hit the average uh, Tunisian uh, citizen uh, very hard, like freezing. Uh, pub, uh, pay for public sector, lifting sub, uh, subsidies and privatization that compelled the, uh, the trade union uh, to call for uh, this uh, strike. Now, I think the, what should happen is that the uh, Tunisian government uh, discusses uh, with uh, the uh, trade union in order to come to some kind of compromise whereby without this particular loan, we cannot move forward. Okay. There is another option of maybe looking at some Arab countries, and we have Qatar, for instance, who has bailed out, uh, bailed out uh, the Tunisia previously. Algeria has also provided some kind of help to the Tunisians, and also in order to renegotiate some kind of uh, conditions whereby the Tunisians can get their uh, money without hurting the, uh, the Tunisian uh, mm -hmm. citizens uh, very, very hard. And that way, I think they will probably be able to go forward. Very quickly, Yusuf, because uh, you alluded to it. I, I want to know where all of this potentially leaves Tunisia in its position with its neighbors and other regional po powers. If it might have to be bailed out by those uh, in its vicinity, what will have to be compromised in order to manage relationships with Egypt, with Saudi, uh, and with others in the region? Well, I think the, the, the most important uh, uh, thing at the moment is for Tunisia, uh, for Tunisia to remain stable. This is very, very important for uh, the region. The Algerian uh, Minister of Interior has paid a visit uh, to uh, Tunisia, and obviously in this particular visit there will be discussions about where Tunisia uh, would uh, go forward. The main important issue, as far as I, I can see, is to try to manage this particular uh, circumstances uh, very carefully, where Tunisia overcomes those problems and those reforms uh, can be uh, carried out. Obviously, there okay. are certain countries, sorry, yeah, I mean, we're just down to our last uh, minute and a half, really. I wanted to get final words from Gaia, actually, because one of the areas we didn't really get to, uh, which is very important as far as the internal dynamics, social dynamics of, of Tunisia are concerned, is how many are complaining about how this government has now managed to alienate women, women in the judiciary, as well as the judiciary itself, and how that is going to play out going forward. Because not only has he now at odds with the unions, but... 50% of the population could feel uh, other, somewhat uh, ostracized by this government when previously it may have had more support. 
Yeah, thank you for asking that question, actually, because uh, last week we have seen a wave of protests uh, taking place in Tunis, uh, the capital, uh, after the decision to sack 57 judges. And amongst those two judges, there were two uh, female judges uh, who were called out, actually, by the president and his supporters uh, uh, for the reason of their um, firing, which was... Uh, uh, which actually depicts how conservative the president is and how uh, risky the current situation is for women in the country, uh, as he called out these two female judges for committing uh, adultery, something that was uh, massively uh, criticized and uh, massively denounced by feminist organizations who gathered uh, in front of the uh, main uh, Tunis court um, in Bebebnet uh, in protest of these decisions and in protest uh, of uh, this choice to um, target uh, uh, women. Now, these uh, feminist organizations, uh, namely we mentioned uh, at TFD, the Tunisian Association of Democratic Women, which is a very prominent organization which took major part also of the negotiations uh, and the talks for the 2014 uh, constitution and for all uh, the um, gains that women uh, have been able to uh, to get throughout the past uh, decade, okay. uh, called out the president and call, uh, called out uh, also uh, the um, format of the current uh, national dialogue and actually denied uh, to uh, take uh, part of it. Okay, Gaia, that will have to be the final word. Very unfortunately, we're out of time for this edition of the news Newsmakers. I'd like to thank really all three of my panelists so much for being with us. Our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey, and we'll see you next time.